right, welcome back to the podcast. Charles Carmichael, Chief Technology Officer at Mandiant, is my guest today. And we are going to talk about real-world threats to healthcare organizations. Uh, Mandiant, as many of you already know, has been front and center in many high-profile investigations of cybersecurity incidents. The company has a pretty unique vantage point into breaches and attacks because of these engagements and has led response efforts around the world against attacks carried out by criminal actors, as well as state-sponsored groups. Um, Healthcare, obviously, is a big target uh, and one that's really escalated since the pandemic with a surge uh, in ransomware, especially, and a lot more. So I'm glad Charles is here to help us separate reality from theoretical when it comes to attacks that are actually happening. Uh, So before we bring in Charles, I want to remind you, please uh, subscribe to the podcast if you haven't already. Uh, Continue listening, spreading the word. Uh, We're on all the major platforms, and I really appreciate the support. So uh, let's get today's episode going and bring in Charles. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks so much for having me. You bet. Thanks for coming on. Um, Before we kind of dig into healthcare specifically, tell me a little bit about your day-to-day and and the teams you manage. I mean, I, I cannot imagine you have a dull day with the the breadth of incidents that you guys cover. Yeah, absolutely. So look, I've been at Mandiant for 12 years now and I've survived a few acquisitions, an acquisition by FireEye and now an acquisition by Google Cloud. And I'll tell you, it's been really exciting um, over the past 12 years, just seeing the company's journey, uh, but also helping a lot of organizations deal with security events, you know, very major security events impacting organizations across sectors and across the globe. And last year, we responded to about 1,200 security events, uh, many of them orchestrated by foreign governments or organized criminals. And um, there's uh, no shortage of learnings that uh, we've been been able to amass by helping organizations respond to security events. So when you engage with an organization that's been breached, what what are your immediate goals as a response team? Is it containment first? Is that the top priority or determining how the breach happened. I know that's all part of it, but yeah. what comes first? You know, it it really depends on the situation. And it's certainly common for us to, when we start doing an investigation, there's um, a number of parallel priorities. You know, one priority is ensuring that we've contained the incident as quickly as possible. And that usually takes many days or weeks to be able to effectively do that. Uh, We also need to anticipate potential litigation. And so there's investigative work and documentation that needs to happen to um, help the organization deal with the inevitable litigation. Uh, But also at the same time, organizations investigate a security event so that they can minimize the exposure to themselves, to their customers, to their partners. And so it's really important for them to, to dig into what actually occurred in order for them to get better and mitigate the risk of this happening in the future. You know, as part of any investigation, there's really five fundamental questions that we try to answer. And and those questions are, you know, number one, um, how did the threat actor actually get access to the environment? Number two is, do they still have access to the environment? And if they do, number three is um, understanding how are they maintaining that access to the organization? So do they deploy back doors? Are they using the VPN to get back into the network? Um, are there other ways in which they could reaccess the organization's environment? Um, the fourth question is understanding what did the attacker do while they were in the network? Did they change files or change data and systems? Did they deploy encryptors across the enterprise? Uh, and the fifth question is, is what data did they steal from the organization? Mm-hmm. Uh, and you're never able to answer all five of those questions as quickly as you'd like, uh, but you're trying to answer the questions as quickly as you can in order to scope out the incident, contain it, and eradicate the threat actors. Right. So how much of your response efforts are technical issues versus people issues? I guess what I'm asking is that you're coming into an organization that's been breached. It's the worst imaginable day or week, the time period that they're going through. You know, how important is it for your teams to kind of also keep that front and center? You know, so to answer your first question around, you know, is do we deal with more technical challenges or people and organizational process challenges? Um, you know, it, it it depends on the situation, and there's always a, a fair amount of technical challenges that we've got to uh, work through. 
there's you know usually a you know decent amount of, of people and process challenges that we've got to you know, address as well, and and so you know we try we try to bring in as much of our experience as we can to help first of all create some calmness to a very chaotic environment. You know, to your point, a lot of organizations that deal with this are dealing with it for the first time ever, and it's one of the toughest days of of people's careers. And so we try to come in with a lot of um, experience, but also empathy. And we often have to remind folks that we're we're not going to be able to answer all the questions that they want us to answer within a matter of hours or days. Everybody wants to get answers as quickly as possible. But but realistically, it it could take several days to weeks to even months to be able to answer all the questions that we're trying to answer and to be able to, you know, really recover from the security event. Mm-hmm. We've got to have um, good bedside manner. We've got to be you know, very empathetic with our clients. And uh, you know, at the same time, we, we have to be able to explain to our clients what are the most effective and efficient ways you know, for them to investigate what's going on and, and to contain the incident. And that's based on experience. And it's based on making lots of mistakes over the years. Um, ideally, we've learned from those mistakes and we could help other organizations not repeat them. Right. I, I would imagine a lot of the victims kind of expect you to guide them through this engagement, so to speak. And I mean, they can run through as many tabletop exercises as they want, but until it really happens, you just kind of don't know how you're going to act. I would imagine. Yeah, that, that's right. Look, the tabletop exercises are, are always important because it creates quite a bit of awareness around what a security event might look like and what an enterprise wide crisis may look like to an organization. And, and tabletop exercises help people test assumptions and clarify assumptions. So, you know, generally speaking, during tabletop exercises, people realize that uh, uh, they have more responsibility in a, um, you know, kind of an enterprise response or crisis situation than they would have expected. Because I think a lot of people by default assume that the IT folks or the security folks will take care of a security event. But, you know, if you can't, conduct business operations or in a healthcare organization, if you can't provide care to patients, I mean, it's more than just an IT and a security problem. And so there's lots of folks that tend to have some level of responsibility during an enterprise-wide security event. And so you test, um, you know, you test the assumptions and you you get a little bit more clarity around who's responsible for what um, and, uh, you know, maybe better ways to to work across different teams when you conduct a tabletop exercise. And, and to your point, you're never going to be able to, to learn everything um, or plan for everything that could potentially happen, but you're trying to get some cycles under your belt so that you're more comfortable and confident in how you respond during an event when it really happens. Right. So let's talk about healthcare a little bit. And I mean, I'm sure you've got a lot of kind of insight in terms of the readiness of organizations when it comes to these events. Is healthcare any particularly any better, any worse uh, compared to other critical industries? Yeah, look, it, I think it depends on which, you know, specifically what you mean when you say healthcare. So I'm going to break it down into yeah. a few, you know, um, subsectors of healthcare. Um, look, there are certainly healthcare providers that have fairly mature and robust security programs. You know, some of the larger healthcare systems have spent a lot of time, effort, and money in hiring good people, buying great technology, building out uh, security processes and, and maturing their security program. Uh, but there's a, a pretty wide range of security maturity across the healthcare providers. And so if you think about you know, smaller organizations like clinics or even smaller healthcare, um, you know, like hospitals that maybe have a single you know, physical facility, um, they tend to not be able to hire top security talent or you know, be able to buy you know, the latest and greatest technologies are build out robust security uh, processes. And, and really, depending on the organization, sometimes there aren't dedicated security teams. You know, you may have IT folks that will bear some of the security responsibility at times, but it may not be their full time responsibility. So you definitely see a, a wide range of security maturity across healthcare providers. Uh, and big and small organizations deal with security events all the time. You know, really, the number one threat to healthcare providers is multifaceted extortion. So it's the combination of the deployment of ransomware plus data theft, 
plus harassment and victim shaming of the organization. Um, and it could even extend beyond that, which is causing a lot of pain to healthcare providers. Now, if you think about a scenario where a, um, you know, where, where medical records are inaccessible to, um, you know, to, to caregivers, the healthcare provider may need to divert patients to other emergency departments or just other, um, other hospitals to, to get treatments. And so that's a incredibly impactful situation um, to the organization dealing with a, a disruptive security event. When you move outside of the uh, providers and you think about uh, healthcare payers, or you think about you know some of the healthcare technology um, and and um, R and D types of organizations, again you've got varying levels of skill and sophistication um, and, and awareness from a, a cybersecurity perspective. The, the types of threats that we see for you know, say biotech, for example, or pharmaceutical organizations. Yes, the number one threat is multifaceted extortion, but there's a close number two threat related to uh, state-sponsored espionage. Now, there are a lot of governments that are interested in learning how um, certain enzymes are produced or how how vaccine research is coming along, especially in the early COVID days when you know lots of different organizations were trying to come up with a vaccine. There were certainly a lot of governments that were interested in that knowledge. And so, you know, there, there's there's definitely a broad range of victims or target organizations when it comes to state-sponsored espionage. And beyond that, look, there are uh, many lower skilled types of attacks like business email compromise or payroll fraud that occurs all the time across lots of different types of organizations, not right. just in healthcare, but lots of other organizations. So in, in terms of gaps, and I, I think you mentioned some of them, is it mostly a resources slash money slash people kind of problem or is it technology and awareness of cybersecurity, you know, potential problems? Um, you know, it's, uh, it, it's, it's a lot of things. It's, uh, and again, it depends on the, the organization and it's, it's hard to generalize uh, across the board, but, you know, to kind of give you, let, let me give you somewhat of an extreme example of um, you know, feedback that I've really heard in health in, in hospitals and, and other healthcare providers. And it's a bit of a dated example, but I think it helps illustrate some of the challenges that healthcare organizations have. You know, physicians are out there saving lives. And I've heard physicians say that they don't want to type in passwords because it takes extra time for them to log into systems. And they shouldn't be bothered with passwords because they're out there saving lives. And again, this is a bit of a dated example um, but one I've heard many times, and it's a bit extreme. And, and I don't know that there are that many physicians that maybe feel that way today than they did a few years ago or maybe 10 years ago. Um, but it's definitely, it definitely illustrates some of the challenges that are hard to address in a healthcare provider environment. Now, I think everybody realizes that medical records and healthcare records are, are very sensitive, and there are regulations that uh, require the protection of that information, uh, but there are just there's a number of challenges in terms of you know, uh, implementing robust security programs for for healthcare providers, and it's also you know sometimes comes down to can you attract the best talent um, in a healthcare organization? Sometimes you can, um, other times it's it's just tough to get the best talent if um, you know if, if the compensation isn't good enough or if um, and this sounds a little bit strange, but if the threats don't seem that real um, to to people that work in, in hospitals. Um, and if they're not seeing kind of the new and the novel all the time, it's sometimes hard to attract the best and the brightest from a security perspective because they want to see the novel attacks um, as, as often as they can. Right. You know, it's weird too because, not weird, but there's been a lot of movement from lawmakers equating, you know, elevating cybersecurity and patient safety, kind of putting them in the same sentence. And I know it's not exactly in the scope of what you guys do, but I wonder how much that's going to prompt movement towards resourcing some of these, especially smaller organizations. Yeah, look, I'll tell you, I mean, there are real world threats to, you know, the well, <laughs> the well-being of individuals and patients, you know, as a result of cyber attacks. You know, as I, as I mentioned before, sometimes when when a healthcare provider deals with a disruptive cyber event, they've got to redirect um, 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 ambulances to other emergency departments. Right. You know, adding minutes to uh, transport people to get uh, the critical care that they need is it can be incredibly impactful. I mean, people could 
you know, potentially die in the process. Uh, and hopefully they're not, but I mean, it's, it's very painful for the, uh, you know, the people that need to get care as quickly as possible. Um, or just think about a situation where you're already in a hospital, but the physicians can't quite take care of you because they can't access the systems that they need. And, um, maybe they can't access the, um, you know, the, um, um, the medicines that they need. And so they've, they've got to reroute or, or rather, um, you know, s- send patients to other facilities. That, that's, that's not a good situation. And it could have real, real world impacts and consequences. And then just on a practical business level too, I mean, healthcare especially is connecting everything all the time. And I, I sometimes wonder if that's happening too fast for the industry in, in from a cyber perspective, obviously. Yeah. Look, um, Look, I, I am generally a fan of the innovation and the technology, uh, and there's a lot of just great innovation that that's occurred. You know, one thing that I would personally appreciate more is a little bit more focus on product security as it relates to creating uh, metal te- medical technologies and uh, you know just other you know um, healthcare solutions that potentially have you know, real world direct impact to to human lives and. You know, there's there's certainly been a lot of research by legitimate security researchers and finding ways to you know dispense too much insulin from an insulin pump that could potentially kill folks. And there's a lot of really good research that's out there, and and I hope that the research helps um, helps organizations that are developing these technologies do it in a more secure way. The, the good news, though, is that we are not seeing real world attacks. In terms of uh, you know threat actors, um, you know manipulating insulin pumps or you know uh, destroying pacemakers in such a way that it actually directly impacts human lives, it certainly could be happening. Yeah, just I'm not getting called in, and my team's not getting called in to respond to those types of events. And I hope that it doesn't happen, and I hope that it never becomes mainstream. Um, right. But we're just not seeing it right now. But of course, there's definitely a number of theoretical. Uh, you know, um, applications for attacks against you know, insulin pumps and, and pacemakers, et cetera. Just from your perspective, why aren't those attacks practical? Is it just too diff- too difficult, too expensive, or just frankly not worth it for an attacker? Just yeah. not enough money in it? <laughs> well, look, again, look, I, I will fully acknowledge that I've got a caseload bias. So, you know, we at Mandy tend to get called by enterprises that deal with cybersecurity attacks. And the enterprises that we work um, with are, um, you know, they are getting compromised in such a way where usually one of two things happen. Um, either they are dealing with a disruptive event that is conducted by a financially motivated attacker where that attacker is extorting the company and is looking to get paid, um, or the threat actor is looking to steal intellectual property or research. And and that's, you know, those are the intentions of the attacks. Um, we're just not dealing with attacks where the adversaries are trying to physically harm people um, as a primary motivation and outcome. Again, that may be happening. It's just not something that Mandiant has visibility into because we're just not getting called in to right. respond to those types of events. So it sounds like much more conventional attacks are happening. And are they opportunistic or are you seeing actually targeted yeah. Attacks. As it relates to multifaceted extortion, the vast majority of attacks are opportunistic. Uh, you know, the ways that threat actors are getting into organizations is usually by um, sending phishing emails to tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people, hoping that somebody will click on a link or open up a malicious attachment and get an initial payload on their computer. Or the threat actor is scanning the internet for either zero day or known vulnerabilities of internet exposed systems and using that as a, um, you know, a pivot point to get into the um, internal network and then deploy ransomware. So, so, so multifaceted extortion is very opportunistic from an initial intrusion perspective um, where it gets a little bit more targeted is after the threat actors know that they have access to say 300 environments, they will pick and choose the top 10 to focus on in a given week for them to conduct future or rather further intrusion operations against and, um, you know, attempt to steal data and then deploy encryptors so that they could extort the company. That, that's when it gets a little bit more deliberate because ultimately they're looking to maximize the amount of money they get. But it's uncommon for 
a ransomware group to say, I hate company X, so I'm going to try to hack into company X. That usually right. doesn't happen. Whereas from a state-sponsored espionage perspective, it's the exact opposite. You, know, you have a government that is tasking a hacking group to break into a particular organization to steal data related to a particular project. So those intrusions are generally very specific, um, very deliberate. Um, and even if the um, the tasking isn't exactly clear today in terms of like steal data related to Project X, if they know that a certain company will continue to innovate technology or research in a certain area, they will task um, you know threat actors to break into those organizations and attempt to stay there for a long period of time so that when there is research that is relevant to be stolen, it can be taken easily or more easily if they already have access to the organization. Yeah. I mean, going back to your previous point, it sounds like we're talking about dwell time and this is a must be a major problem for more organizations, especially for defenders. Can you kind of talk a little bit about dwell time from your perspective, what it means to you and and you know what defenders can do about it? Yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting because dwell time is is one of those stats that we, we've been tracking at Mandiant for many years. And in the early days of us tracking the stat, um, uh, and that started around 2011, you know, the dwell time was over a year in which the intrusion occurred and the organization discovered the security incident. And a year is a, a very long period of time for an organization to be compromised and not know about it. The good news is over the years, the dwell time has shrunk to the point where it's still somewhat long. I mean, it's, it's a few weeks at this point. Um, but the reasons for the um, reduction in dwell time aren't necessarily the best reasons. Um, the way that we are calculating dwell time is basically when there is a essentially an external notification to a victim organization that there's been a, a hack. And that external notification could be the threat actor actually reaching out to the victim organization saying that we've hacked you. Or it could be them running a D or running an encryptor across the enterprise that ultimately deploys a ransomware um, ransom note on the computer. Or it could be a security researcher that reaches out to an organization and lets them know that they've been compromised. So uh, there's a lot of organizations that unfortunately are learning about security incidents um, because a external third party is telling them about it. And, uh, you know, the, the dwell time right now on average is a few weeks. And, and that's because, um, you know, we do recognize that there's a case of bias because we're just dealing with a lot of ransomware attacks that tend to have a shorter dwell time than the espionage attacks where the threat actor doesn't ever want to get caught. Can you pinpoint a, a time or maybe a reason um, why ransomware attacks went from just dropping a, an encryptor on a site, you know, on a on a system and flashing up a ransom note to, you know, a, a period of dwell time, a period of looking for other vulnerabilities, exfiltrating data? I mean, it's definitely been an evolution from yep. the early days of ransomware. Woo. Yeah, look, I'll tell you, when we first started seeing ransomware, um, I, I think it started roughly around the 2013 timeframe. And, and one of the earliest ransomware variants that we saw was um, was a ransomware variant that basically locked your desktop and it ch changed your wallpaper to that of a picture of uh, President Obama basically sticking his finger at you saying that uh, you've, um, you've downloaded illegal um, files onto your computer and if you don't pay... Two hundred fifty dollars, um, then um, you won't be able to get access to your computer. And and it said that uh, you know the U.S. government is working in in collaboration with Mandiant to um, you know to do this investigation. And so we end up getting a whole lot of calls from from folks that thought it was a legitimate message, um, asking us why we locked their computer. And it was somewhat of a uh, disruptive situation for us because we were getting a lot of phone calls from from a lot of people that were impacted by this. But when you fast forward by a few years, there was a, a group that went by the name of Sam Sam. Um, they were a group of Iranian operators that were uh, basically hacking into companies. They knew who their victims were. So they started asking for extortion demands that were higher than the usual amount of ransom that other organizations were being asked for. Mm -hmm. um, you know, In the early days, the extortion demands were, say, $500 to $1,000. Because you didn't know, or the threat actor didn't know if they hit a multi-billion dollar corporation or 
a grandmother that was trying to get uh, photos back of her grandchildren. And um, in 2015, the Sam Sam crew, they knew who their victims were. And so they were asking for extortion demands that were um, much, much higher at the time. So they were about 15000 or 20000 or $25,000 per victim, which at the time, that was a lot of money because it was relative to the $500 demands. And one of the things that the Sam Sam folks did was they provided, and this is going to sound strange, but they provided really good customer support for victims that paid. And when a victim paid and the decryptor didn't work as well as it should have, the threat actor would apologize and say, they'll get their engineers to fix the, um, the decryptor and we'll send you an updated version tomorrow. And so there are a lot of people that paid the extortion demand that ended up getting positive outcomes. And a lot of groups took note of that. And they realized that if you provide you know, good customer support, which again, I realize it sounds silly, but if they did that and people felt like they got positive outcomes when they paid an extortion demand, more people would end up paying. And so the demand started getting higher and higher, and we started seeing six-figure six demands uh, pretty regularly. At the end of 2019, a group called Maze started really, you know, started the concept of multifaceted extortion. You know, in addition to deploying encryptors, they would steal data from organizations so that uh, the whole dynamic around the extortion changed so that it, you weren't just paying for a decryptor to recover your data, you were paying for a promise of the threat actor to not publish the data that they right. stole from the organization. And that really changed the dynamic. And so there are plenty of organizations that paid simply because they didn't want their sensitive data to be published on the internet. Um, and now we've seen a continued evolution of extortion where, where threat actors are, are getting much more aggressive in, um, in their attacks against employees at companies, sometimes family members of the organization. And, um, Many victims are feeling coerced to pay extortion demands. About half of our clients end up paying an extortion demand, which is uh, probably pretty surprising, but uh, just it's a really tough position for these organizations to be in. Yeah, I was going to say that percentage is probably a little higher than you would expect, given you know law enforcement's always saying don't pay, security experts are always saying don't pay, but reality is reality. Yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, I guess hand in hand with that, hospitals are probably a pretty juicy target. I mean, the availability is, is huge and reliability is huge in that, in that sector. And, you know, we don't want to be moving patients. We don't want to be delaying treatment, affecting care. Um, that has to go into an attacker's mindset as well as like, they're likely going to pay. It, it is. Um, it's definitely, you know, one of the considerations that healthcare providers think about as they, make a pay or no pay decision. And there's, you know, there's a, there's a number of criteria that they think about in terms of like this paying actually get you semi-positive outcomes. And look, those semi-positive outcomes could be, you know, can the healthcare provider resume patient care operations sooner if they pay a threat actor? You know, there's a misconception that organizations that pay um, don't have backups. I mean, fact is today, most organizations have backups. You know, of course, there's always questions around how, consistent are their backups how recent are they um, but you know the real question is um, you know were they destroyed as part of the attack um, how resilient is the backup environment such that um, you know can it actually um, quickly recover every single system that might have been impacted by a threat actor and that's usually the big reason for you know or one of the reasons for paying a threat actor is because you know, companies have backups that they can rely on. It's just they can't recover everything using their backup infrastructure because it's so taxed with, uh, you know, the recovery process for the core systems. And so some organizations pay because they're looking to accelerate the process of recovering um, their data mm -hmm. and paying sometimes helps. Um, another reason for paying is sometimes, um, you know, organizations feel like um, there is an obligation to them to pay to mitigate the risk of highly sensitive patient information being published on the internet. Um, and there's, there are a few notable cases where um, healthcare providers or payers didn't actually pay the extortion demand and um, patient information was published on the internet. And the patients or the insured said, hey, you know, you company should have paid the extortion demand because the harm 
isn't, you know, you're not dealing with the harm. We, the people whose healthcare records are now published, we are dealing with the pain. Right. We're dealing with the harm. And so that's something that's definitely changing the calculus around paying, um, specifically as it relates to healthcare payers and providers in the United States. You know, they, they recognize that their customers or their patients or their insureds uh, may end up dealing with the pain if, um, you know, sensitive health information is, is exposed on the internet. Mm-hmm. From your experience in terms of healthcare specifically, um, how well positioned are they for recovery operations? I mean, you, you come in and you want to contain, you want to, you know, preserve forensics, et cetera, but recovery is really issue for the victim. How, how well positioned are healthcare organizations in terms of recovery? Yeah, look, it depends on the organization. I'll just say in general, yeah, uh, we never, or our clients never recover as quickly as they would like to recover. And that's just because most organizations, and it's not specific to healthcare, but in general, most organizations, when they built their, um, or when they designed their backup and resiliency solutions, you know, they were anticipating, you know, um, natural disasters, maybe taking out a data center. So maybe they'd be able to, um, you know, um, leverage another data center um, and, and recover. But what people don't really think about is that really every data center could potentially be impacted at the same time, or every cloud environment could be impacted at the same time um, by a threat actor. And and that's the thing that people aren't necessarily thinking about. And, and I think we have a lot of work to do as a community over the next few years to rethink how we've, um, you know, architected our backup and our resiliency processes. And think about the cyber events that could take everything offline in a matter of minutes or hours, as opposed to maybe one site going down when other sites may still be available. I, I had a question for you about the state actor mm-hmm. problem. I, from your experience, is it kind of limited to areas of research, of vaccine development, et cetera, places where there's a lot of intellectual property uh, being developed and needs to be secured. Is that where you're seeing state actors? And maybe as a follow-up, is that where the insider problem is is yeah. most prevalent as well? Yeah. So from both a state sponsor perspective and a government recruited insider perspective, we tend to see the types of organizations that mostly deal with those are those organizations that have a lot of very valuable healthcare research or um, intellectual property, maybe, you know, vaccine development information or, or enzyme development information. Um, that's what foreign governments are interested in. Um, so today, you know, there's generally relatively you know, commonly accepted rules of engagement when it comes to, you know, hacking into organizations and, um, and, and one of the you know, tolerated or semi-tolerated, um, you, know, um, you know, scenarios is, you know, stealing information for intellectual property data theft purposes. And I, and I, maybe I shouldn't say it's tolerated, but I think we all have an awareness that it's happening. We don't necessarily like it um, happening, uh, but it continues to happen. And, and it's, again, it's generally focused on those organizations that spend a lot of time, effort, and money and have really smart people that come up with ways to, you know, cure diseases or, you know, treat diseases and, and those are the types of organizations and the motivations that we tend to see state-sponsored actors conducting their intrusions for. Um, we don't see state-sponsored actors, you know, want, wanting to willingly disrupt healthcare operations and, you know, inflict physical harm on patients. It just, right. We're not seeing that. You know, perhaps that could change during times of war, but uh, we're just not seeing that today. Mm-hmm. When you walk into a victimized organization, what, what's their first goal? Is it recovery or is it uh, containment? I mean, just their expectation. I know what yours is going in, but what's their? Yeah, usually, you know, it's, it's, I mean, it really depends on the organization, but I think generally speaking, people are looking to contain the incident and resume business operations, assuming that we're dealing with a disruptive event, like mm-hmm. a multifaceted extortion event. Uh, when you're dealing with a state-sponsored operator, for the most part, there's no impact to business operations. You hardly even know that the threat actor is in the environment. They're just silently stealing data um, over time. And in that situation, the goal would be to try to contain the incident as best as possible, stop the bleeding, and, and eradicate the threat actor from the environment. 
sounds like a lot of really hard problems for organizations and aside from their day-to-day just kind of defending yeah. conventional attacks i mean you know a lot of um, a lot of ceos are forced to become you know cybersecurity professionals during a, a security event and look of course they're going to rely on their you know chief information security officer and their security teams and their it teams and the external experts but there's a lot of ceos that uh, you know have to add on four, five, six, eight hours a day thinking about the cybersecurity matter, um, depending on how, on how big of a deal it is. And it's incredibly disruptive to a, a CEO that has a regular day job. Yeah. All right. So as a last question, Charles, and, and thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Just to, a, any words of advice for organizations, for defenders? I mean, you, you've talked a lot about some of the, the problems, but I mean, I'm sure there are some subtle things that organizations could be doing, even if it's simple things like, you know, establishing relationships with law enforcement, buying Bitcoin uh, in case you're attacked. I mean, there's a lot, I think, that that organizations can kind of do under the covers. Yeah. Um the, the number one piece of feedback that I give to any organization is to conduct ongoing red team exercises against the environment. Think about a number of different plausible scenarios and conduct offensive tests to determine how effective is the security organization detecting the attacks that are occurring and how quickly can you respond to the attacks and stop them while they're in progress. And what I find um, you know, red teamers do a really good job of finding real world issues that need to be fixed. And so you you don't, you can't argue the findings of a red team because a red team is going to show you that they actually got access to whatever it is they got access to, mm-hmm. or they had the ability to do whatever it is they say they had the ability to do. Um, and so you just have a, a prioritized roadmap of things that need to be fixed. You'd rather the good guys identify these security vulnerabilities than the bad actors. And so um, highly recommend organizations doing you know, some level of regular um, red team exercises against the organization. Great. All right, Charles, lots of good stuff today. Uh, a lot of food for thought. And uh, I definitely think we should do another one of these down the road and, and kind of catch up as you guys uh, continue to walk into these organizations and, and learn from them. Absolutely. All right. Have a great day. Thanks again for coming on. No worries. Thanks a lot. Um,